Two things just popped into my head, and the first was soggy cornflakes. You think all memory is gone, and yet there are ways through, little kind of golden threads. Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft, and in this episode we're going to be delving into memory with three writers who each approach this theme from completely different directions. Award-winning novelist Ema McBride takes us to a series of hotel rooms to see what memories they unearth and how they can warp and change over time. Best-selling food writer Mira Soda shares some of her first food memories and why preserving family recipes is so important. And here in the studio, we're joined by Nikki Gerrard. Known to many readers as one half of the thriller writing duo Nikki French, the other half being her other half, Sean French, Nikki has also written fiction under her own name and also an incredible book on dementia, something she has campaigned about after her father suffered from the condition. Her book, What Dementia Teaches Us About Love, shares some of his story as well as others that illuminate how we could look after sufferers better and it is an absolute pleasure to have her here to talk about it. Welcome Nikki. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, thank you. It's an incredible book. Uh, your look at dementia because it shares as I said the sort of your personal experiences with your father but also the stories of other people who've suffered from dementia in different ways and I suppose that's the first thing about dementia which is that it affects people very very differently it's not a sort of simple medical no virus. so the first thing about dementia is it's the wrong name it should be plural we should talk about dementias because there are as many dementias as there are people who have the illness i mean people people think that it's just about memory mm. it's not just about memory and the loss of memory there are all sorts of other much more niche things that go along with it it, it sort of affected your father and it affected him for for many years you talk about how it was a very gradual thing um with this episode looking at this idea of memory of course one of the things that often happens to sufferers is, is this loss of of memory this loss of i guess what makes them them how long was it before you realized i suppose the first inklings that there was something different to how we all forget things on a daily basis you know yeah i mean that that's so so as we get older as I, I mean i'm 61 yeah. i'm becoming vastly more forgetful there is this natural kind of forgetfulness and it becomes to feel sinister mm. <laughs> for, for many of us we kind of think does this mean that I'm getting dementia but we all forget as we get older um, and it's a very for lots of people especially when they have Alzheimer's which is the kind of dementia that my father had that's like gradual memory loss things gradually fall away and so bit by bit what's natural suddenly so gradually starts to feel something that's kind of sinister and suggestive of an illness and that I mean I would what I'd like to stress is that dementia dementias mm. are illnesses they're illnesses they're nothing to be ashamed of they're something that's going wrong with our brain and illness in the brain so with my father I mean he was always very absent-minded and slightly eccentric um, and he lived in his own world so he was forgetful all his life he was always somebody who would kind of not remember people's names and forget what he was supposed to be doing and I'm not sure that was the strange thing I'm not quite sure at what point we started to think that something was wrong and more than that I'm not sure at what point he started to think that something was wrong and tried to hide it from us mm. and from himself so it was like a slow slide but then there came a time where it was impossible to ignore you talk very clearly about the, the point at which you need serious medical care. There is that sort of big shift that can happen, which is that somebody who has been living at home is taken into a hospital and that suddenly you're then controlled by the rules of the hospital. Yes. And the carer is often kept away from yes. the person they've been looking after yes. because of things like visiting hours or whatever it might yeah. be. And that, that can sometimes mean that this person is left alone or but, separated yeah. from their family for, for huge yeah. amounts of time. So what happened with my father is he had, he had dementia for about 10 years and he had it in quite a kind way. He didn't, it didn't change his personality. He just gradually lost his everyday capacity and his memory. But he went on, he was living at home, he was walking by the river, he was working in his garden, he was teasing his grandchildren. He was articulate and mobile and healthy and largely contented. He went into hospital and we were not allowed 
to see him outside of visiting hours. And then we were not allowed to see him at all because there was an outbreak of norovirus. And it meant that really we abandoned him for, for actually many days on end. We didn't see him at all, which now I look back on it and I cannot believe we were as obedient to those very cruel and unnecessary rules mm. as we were. Um, so we abandoned him. We weren't there to... Home didn't follow... He left home and home was not allowed to follow him. And without all the things that kept him connected to the world that he loved, without us there to help him eat, help him walk, talk to him, do the crossword with him, read him poems, mm. hold his hand, stroke his hair, tell him we loved him, without all of those things that kind of connected him to his familiar and beloved world. He just lost himself. Um, and that is not unusual. When people are taken out of their everyday structure, when people are taken away from the, those who love them, mm. they can go off a cliff. People are very, very precarious when they have dementia. So he went from living well with the illness to nine months of dying with the illness. Mm. It was just a very prolonged, slow motion and horrible dying mm. of dementia. When somebody requires that kind of level of medical attention, it's not that we know how to reverse dementia or how to help people to reconnect with their memories, but it is simply that, as you say, with that family contact and that constant reassurance, which is both physical and mental and emotional, you, you're you're holding it at bay, basically, and allowing them to yes, have a quality of life. Absolutely, that's absolutely so, right. And if you take that away, yes. it's like the safety net disappears, and they yes. have a really precipitous decline. Which is why that kind of care that you often talk about in the book is so important to keep. It's, keeping it's it. absolutely crucial. I mean, in I guess what I the way I think about it is is that word connectivity. I mean. We all have this kind of inner, you know, being alive means having an, an inner self which you connect to the outer world. And that's the kind of flow between you and the world, the flow of the self and the world. And that's what makes it, you know, that's one of the ways of defining what it is to be human, what mm. it is to have a voice. And there are many ways of having a voice. I don't just mean the kind of speaking words. I mean, just the way in which you can connect with life with other people have reciprocal relationships and that what that's what gets endangered in dementia and bit by bit you lose your capacity to be able to communicate mm. yourself i'm not sure you lose yourself ever but you lose your sense of self and your ability to communicate it and so with my father when he went into hospital, he could still have that kind of living communication. And five weeks later, it was gone. Or at least I say it was gone. And this brings us back to kind of memory. He came out of hospital after five weeks. And he was, you know, if you looked at him, not knowing him, he was gone. Mm. There was nothing left of him. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He couldn't recognise people. He couldn't lift his head up from a pillow. He, he could smile a bit, heartbreakingly. Mm. He could do nothing. There was nothing left. And yet he was left. There was something of my father who was indelibly there. And there were heartbreaking and poignant moments when we could find ways to connect to that and this is about memory so there was one time um which was like was kind of miraculous really where when I was there with my children and we were reading poems to him he used to really love poetry and he knew lots of poems off by heart and when we were little he would read poetry to us and I made him an anthology of all his favourite poems and we stood around his bed and we recited I Must Go Down to the Seas Again by John Macefield mm. The Lonely Sea in the Sky and All I Ask is a Tall Ship and the Star to Steer Her By and it's like a kind of incantation or a mm. song really and my father he couldn't he could say nothing he could not he did not know his own name and he joined in to that poem and he recited it or some of it with us and got to the end of course it's a poem about dying actually mm. so it was, it was doubly moving and it was the most extraordinary moment of suddenly realizing that you think somebody is gone you think all memory is gone and yet there are ways through into the self like there are kind of little kind of golden threads of memory with which 
you can connect to another person. And people do it with music, people do it with words, people do it by dancing, people do it by food and eating, people do it kind of by going back to places that they love. And it's like that there are grooves in the self that memory has carved that remain when everything else is gone. And it's quite extraordinary about what it is, what it says about being human and being alive and what, what kind of how life has carved into you, mm. if you like. So you're more than the sum of your parts. I mean, I'm not sure if it was comforting or terrifying, yeah. but, <laughs> but it was something extraordinary. It's interesting you mentioned the poetry because one of the things that comes across really clearly in your book is the connection between creative things and, and the brain and how it is <clears throat> so stimulating for people who are able to remain creative and to do things like reciting poetry or painting or sort of doing things that engage some whatever that creative part of the brain is keeping that stimulated yes. seems to have a huge impact it has on. a huge it, it has the most extraordinary impact i mean i've seen time and again i've been in kind of residential homes or in hospitals and i've seen people who are sitting slumped in their chair kind of unable to respond and then some piece of music comes on that they love. Mm. I mean, it can't be any piece of music. I mean, no. you know, people always kind of playing Vera Lynn or, or you know, <laughs> kill me now. I just think it has to be specific to yeah. their lived life. But a piece of music will come on and it will seem like they come alive mm. again. Um, and it's true with people who love art. You put a paintbrush into their hand and they can paint again. Or they can look at pictures that they love and they can talk about them. Or I've been dancing, I've been to dance classes and people who can no longer really talk um, can still dance. So they can talk with their body. Yeah. And you can re- and then and then you're equal as well. And that's really crucial. I mean, the book that I wrote, What Dementia can teach us teaches us about love it's the title is very important because it's not saying what we can learn about dementia mm. it's saying what can dementia teach us about us about us you know so it can be our teacher really and it teaches us a lot about the power of art and it teaches us a lot about the kind of power of memory and how memory digs deep down into us and it teaches us a lot about how we have to think about ourselves, not just as autonomous, individual, independent, self-sufficient, healthy, vigorous individuals, but as kind of collaborative members of this kind of community of people who are kind of dependent and who have needs and who are frail. I mean, we're all frail, but we don't like to think that we're frail. And dementia has this way of just showing us quite how frail and precarious we are. Yeah. The other thing I'd say, which is a bit more kind of abstract in a way, but goes to the heart of the matter, which is I think that when I started writing the book, I felt that dementia was... And this links up with what I was saying about how we treat people as objects, mm. because I think I did that, and maybe still a bit do that. I mean, it's a work in progress. I think... I thought that when people have dementia, people in the advanced stages of dementia, I thought of them as gone, as lost. So I did, in a way, think of them as objects. Um, I thought that people with dementia lost their selves. And I don't think that anymore. I profoundly don't think that. I think that I've seen so many people and spoken to so many people and their carers who have taught me to understand that you you don't lose yourself. What you lose is your sense of self. You lose your narrative self. You lose your sense of identity because you lose your memory. And memory is what gives us coherence mm. and what enables us to tell our own story. You know, memory is the story maker. And we lose ourselves as a story in the life. But the self, that kind of mysterious self that I saw with my father when he was reciting a poem to us or still had his sweet smile and there was something still there. That self does indelibly remain. And I would, if I, if I was religious, I'd call it soul. And I'm not religious, but I think I still have to call it soul because I can't have another word that is as, 
that means the same. I think that the soul remains until the day we die. And so we have to treat people kind of practically better and mindfully, but we have to treat people soulfully as we would hope to be treated in our turn. One of the sort of stimulants to memory that you mentioned earlier was was food, and it's something I think that's quite familiar in literature. I mean, of course, Proust, <laughs> Proust. Proust Madeline <laughs> yeah. you know, helped to, to, to create one of the... Well, but I think it is probably the longest novel in, in history. Um, I also remember as a child searching out Turkish delight after having read oh, about so it in ah, yeah. I mean, it was a profoundly disappointing <laughs> experience when I finally found it and tasted it. But um, Turkish food, delight and, and the orange marmalade sticky... Sticky marmalade roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's uh, these that things. book, yeah. And everybody has these these food things that will suddenly bring back a memory, often from childhood. Um, our next author is has written about food in in many publications like the Guardian and uh, the Pool. And she first put family recipes into a book uh, that was called Made in India. Since then, Mirasoda has celebrated vegetarian cookery in fresh India. She's gone further afield with East, which contained both vegan and vegetarian recipes. And I spoke to her to find out about her very first food memories and why writing recipes down became completely crucial in order to preserve generations of her family's love of cooking. Oh, you know what? Two things just two things just popped into my head. And the first was soggy cornflakes in milk and how much I really just didn't like the they just tasted salty and weird and floppy and I really didn't like cornflakes growing up. <laughs> Um, and then there was another one that bounced up as well, and that was our Gujarati potato curry, and that was something that I really loved, the way the, the potatoes um, just absorbed this incredible, like, tomato-y, well, like, rasam around it, this sort of juice, and, um, and I used to love, like, scooping up some, some of that potato and dipping it into yoghurt, um, and I couldn't scoop properly when I was really young, you know, because there's a technique, you kind of tear off the bread um, and then you sort of, you scoop. So I just dip the bread instead, like mash the potato and just like stab it <laughs> a little bit. Um, but that was one of my favourite things to eat. It's something that my mum used to cook. Um, I mean, it, it punctuated our oh, weeks when I was growing up. I mean, she would cook it weekly. It's a really famous, it's a really famous dish. Um, the other thing that we would eat regularly was the same chapatis um, dipped in um, mango. Um, it was like pureed mango, and that was so lovely. You had this like hot chapati, and they were always hot, freshly made, um, like sometimes too hot to put your fingers on, <laughs> um, and just like in this cool and gorgeous um, mango. It was called Russ. Um, that was sort of pureed mango, and that was and it was straight out of the fridge, and that was really really nice. Um, yeah. And did your did your mum encourage you to cook? You know what? She didn't encourage me to cook. I mean, we would do things together. Like I, she would, you know, as an activity, I was rolling wonky chapatis from the moment that I could look over the, you know, the kitchen table, but. Um, she would tell me to go upstairs and do my homework and that she would do the cooking because she didn't want the same life that she had as a housewife for me. Um, she wanted me to study, you know, get good grades and then hopefully become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, something that probably wasn't a food writer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I came to cooking quite late on in life, actually, when I left home. Um, and went to university and realised quite how much I missed my mother's cooking. So I rang her up and said, um, can you send me some recipes? And she said, darling, I've never written any of this down. Um, if you want to learn how to cook, you have to come home and watch me. And that's how I learned how to cook and how your grandmother learned how to cook. And I, re I sort of panicked when she said that because I realised that um, these recipes that were potentially hundreds of years old, if not older, had just been passed down orally um, and, you know, through one woman in the family passing it down to another. And that potentially that could stop with me unless I went home and started to record these recipes. So I used to take the train home from London where I was studying, um, back home in Lincolnshire, would just time everything, like level the teaspoons 
and she was she said what are you doing <laughs> if you um, taste your ingredients when they're raw when they hit the pan and when you finish cooking you'll understand how they behave and then you'll be cook, you'll be able to cook anything you want um, which is still like the best advice that she's ever given me um, and I took I felt like I took flight from there it's hard to tell what my daughter <laughs> will want to eat when she when she grows older um, but I know I'd like her to learn in the same way that I have um, you know it, I'm sure she the nice thing about the family recipes is that they they are available in a book and they will be when she grows older and starts to cook herself um, but I'd love to be able to cook with her in the kitchen and we do do that she's only two years old um, but she makes she makes ice lollies and cakes and chapatis as well she rolls and throws into a pan from a, a huge distance so she's not too, <laughs> not too close to the hob I am my mother's daughter and quite fearful of her <laughs> being in any way hurt <laughs> and how does she feel about conflict Cornflakes. I haven't introduced her to cornflakes. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that upon her. <laughs> really fascinating. Two sort of things there, I think, with, with FUBO, which is one, which is how it takes you back to childhood and mm -hmm. you can immediately taste those things, but also how it seemed to involve other senses. So not just taste, but also the, the hot chapatis and the cold mango. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly it becomes this very sensual experience. And texture, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it is like one of those portals, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And then also that sort of the importance of, of remembering these recipes and getting them down on paper. But of course, allied to that, the fact that actually sometimes there's no substitute for the practical thing of actually making a dish and that you, you can cook without a recipe. As you say, if you taste your ingredients as you're cooking, you should be able to create the, the flavour that you're going for. So it's probably about not being scared, isn't yeah. it? And that I so so Sean, who I write with, yes. um, he never cooked when he was growing up, and now he's a slavish recipe follower. <laughs> so he, uh, you know, <laughs> which I think is quite familiar with lots of men of a certain generation who like to cook, but you have to follow it absolutely exactly that recipe. Yeah, because he, so he's, he can't improvise. He can't kind of. He just has to just every speck has to be in and. Whereas if you if, if if like her daughter you grow up cooking she'll just be able to do it all and yeah, she'll just feel, feel she'll feel at home in it and there is something as well I think to do this is to do with memory we're, we're increasingly becoming a society that is used to looking things up because we have a phone for example yeah. that allows us to yeah. look up the recipe for anything should we want to online and so that instead of using our brains to answer a question we always just go straight to Google so instead of like how how old is so and so? Yeah, so you're slightly guess? out. Of, you're slightly out of touch yeah. on you, with yes, exactly with your instincts of it. I just yeah. sort of wonder whether that's ever going to have a, an actual effect on how our brains work and retain memory. Well, maybe it is so already. Maybe it, I mean I, I think there is an argument that already the kind of internet has changed the way we think. The kind of what our kind of how our memory. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how we retain information. How we retain because yeah. we have no need to yeah. at the moment because no. we can always just ask. No. So, yeah, it's weird. Because I, I have a thing, we were talking earlier about that, that poetry coming back to your father, almost instinctively. And I have, used to be an actor, and I think I, I used to have to learn lines all the time. And what's weird to me now is what I can still remember. And From what I've those forgotten. like that. So, and what's, and do you, what do you remember? So what's weird is that I can still remember the audition speeches that I had to learn <laughs> for my drama school auditions. Oh, which, my goodness. Because it was so important. What were they? Oh, I did Richard the Second, which was quite unusual. About the, the crown. Yeah, sort of one of his speeches in in prison, and I can still remember every single word of that speech. Whereas the lines that I learned and performed for four and a half years in Warhorse, I forgot those lines when I had been out of that show for about three weeks. Okay. Because I had to go back in. Yeah. To be emergency cover, so I sat in the green room and I said, "Could you go and get me a script just in case I had to go on?" And they said, but "You know, <laughs> you know the words because you would do." And I was like, "I've literally they've gone because." My brain didn't need them anymore, and so yeah. it, it just just got rid of them. So yeah. yeah, it's very weird. Well, it is weird. I remember a speech I gave in a public speaking competition when I was about eleven, and it started off every year. Hundreds of thousands of lemmings pour themselves over the cliffs in a mass migration to death. Do you want to die? <laughs> it's a very bad, very bad speech, and it's not a true fact anyway. But now, <laughs> I was, and I try and learn poems off by heart like yeah. once every couple of weeks I learn a new poem 
and I can learn it quite quickly, but it just knocks out the one that I'd learned before. <laughs> so I've only got one poem at any one time sitting in my head. Just limited memory space. Limited memory is. space. Yeah. Really interesting. Well, because what's important with memory is, I mean, memory is an artificial thing. It's like a process. It's not a thing. It's mm. a process. So we are, and we're always just remembering what we remember, what we remember. So when it's, there's never a pure memory we have. It's like a kind of repetitive thing that we kind of acquire and then reacquire. So mm. it's always art, an artificial thing. Mm. Um, and what's equally important about memory is not just what we, I mean, m- forgetting can be a terrible thing, but remembering too much is a curse. There are people who have terribly good memories and it's like a blight in their life. They remember, because memory is very hurtful as yeah. well. Do you know, you have actually provided the perfect segue for our next author. Because uh-huh. we've spoken... I'm so glad. Well, no, because we, we've spoken about <laughs> the, sort of the, the heartbreak of, of losing memory. Um, but our next author is actually going to allow us to talk about how remembering too much can, can be, as you say, it can be a curse. It's yeah. something that you, you can't let go of. Um, our, our next author, she has used fiction uh, to explore the theme of memory. And after the success of A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing and The Lesser Bohemians, Emma McBride has returned with a novel called Strange Hotel, in which her female narrator is assailed by memories as she stays in a series of European hotel rooms. She spoke to me about being tormented by memories and the opportunities that fiction offers when writing about this very slippery idea. Yeah, I think... When I started initially, it it seemed like one hotel room and and how much can one remember in one hotel room. But of course, as I went on, I was reminded of the many hotel rooms that I have stayed in in my life, and and the way that different rooms in different cities can open up different vistas in memory, uh, and so it just I pursued it. I think um, you know she's she's pretty strongly against memory and and is very resistant to it and it follows her around and it torments her um but memory is not a comfortable place for her and even memories of things that once brought her happiness are no longer uh bringing her happiness now now they're a form of torment yeah i suppose it's the idea of two different types of memory that we have uh, the kind of passive memory which is how we tend to think of memory as something that is it's over it's it's relatively benign. It's something we can indulge in nostalgically, um, and and it's useful. But it's it is over, and it's it, uh, it it can't affect us anymore. And then, of course, the other type of memory is the active memory, is the way that m- the memory never is passive and over. The way it continues on inside you, the way it changes over the years, the way. Um, you remember certain things in one way, and ten years later suddenly they take on a whole different aspect um, and what was once comforting can suddenly become malevolent. And certainly for the character in this book, memory is something that's very antagonistic for her. And although she remembers being with this man as a, as a good time in her life, it was love, she says a couple of times, um, the absence of him and and what memory means in that absence has become very, very difficult for her and something that she's, she's not very keen to indulge in and actively, you know, closes down when memory, she can feel it start to, to build up inside her. It gets triggered by something, something small, the way the light falls on something or the way somebody turns in the bed next to her. And she, she can feel it assemble itself like an army inside her that it's, a, it's about to start making its approach. And she has various strategies that she uses to kind of close it off before it gets too far. And then sometimes it just overcomes anyway. One of the strategies that you use in the novel is, is language. Uh, sort of ever the stylist, you, you use sort of quite complicated sentences in order to I suppose to keep those memories at bay or to keep the emotions at bay is that right yeah I think you know the purpose of the of the language in the book which is very different to my previous two novels which is very formal and sometimes really overly formal is about that about keeping a sort of polite distance from her own memory and using language as a you know, I remember years ago a teacher saying to me that the more, you know, the more words you use in a sentence, the politer you are. And uh, 
And I suppose, and that's how you express your politeness to others, by right? thanking them very much as opposed to thanks and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I suppose I, I wanted to play with that, with the notion of language not being a form of communication, but a form of disruption of communication, even inside the person herself. I suppose I'm interested in how people interact with each other and how that changes over time and how memory becomes changed by those interactions, how we become changed then by the memories and how the memories change. And there's a section in the novel where she returns to a memory and then imagines a different outcome of that, of that memory, uh, which in, then in turn affects her in the present. Um, and I suppose that, that does interest me, how people interact. and. I suppose the male-female dynamic holds a certain fascination for me. Um, so I suppose, you know, that, that's why that recurs. The fun part of it for me with this book was using, you know, a section from the previous novel, from The Lesser Bohemians, as the jumping off point. So kind of using that character as though, as though that book or that, that occurrence in that book was a memory of this character. And whether it is or not, I don't know, but it was kind of interesting to fictionalize a fictional memory um, and to give it a, a life inside another fiction as well um, which perhaps makes it slightly complicated <laughs> but um, you know to, to kind of create one character and then imagine another outcome for her in a completely different book and then have her imagine another outcome for herself from that from that first book was was kind of a game. It was kind of a fun game to play. Time now to hear from our booksellers with their recommendations inspired by the theme of memory. Hi, I'm Martha from Sheffield and the book I'd like to recommend on memory is Wendy Mitchell's groundbreaking book, Somebody I Used to Know. Uh, the first memoir about dementia by someone living with dementia. It's moving, it's uplifting, it's surprising and it's absolutely essential reading. Hi, I'm Nick Walden, a bookseller at Waterstones Piccadilly and my book on the theme of memory is The Sense of an Ending. It's about uh, a man in late middle age who gets a letter that takes him back to the days of his youth and he explores in memory his uh, great times at school and what happened to the people he knew then and what became of them all. It's beautiful. It's the kind of book you need to read twice. Hi, I'm Katrina from Glasgow and my recommendation on the topic of memory is Playthings by Alex Phoebe. It's a fictionalised imagining of the case of Judge Daniel Schreiber, who was of interest to both Freud and Lacan. Here Phoebe meticulously presents a first-person account of the confusion, frustration and despair of living with a mind out of control gaps in memory, unreliable recall and perception, and a feeling of the unreal lead to intense paranoia.